2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women. They are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. Just as Janez and Jambres oppose Moses, so also these men oppose the truth, men of depraved minds who, as far as a faith is concerned, are rejected. But they will not get very far because, as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. Amen. Let's pray, please. Father, thank you for this, your holy word, and thank you for this message, and thank you for these people who are here. And may your spirit open our hearts and minds to you, your message. May we draw near to you through this, and may we be pleasing to you. For it is in your name, Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, Paul's writing here, and it's about those who oppose the truth. Oppose the truth. In our text, Paul describes some specific people who oppose the truth of God. They were home invaders. Uh, they didn't know the truth, and they had depraved minds. There's this little girl who came early one morning to her mother, and she says, Mama, uh, which is worse, Mama? Is it to tell a lie or is it to steal? The mother replied, that, hey, you know, both those sins are pretty bad, so I don't know if I could tell you which one is worse. Well, Mama said to the little girl, I've been thinking a lot about this here lately, and, and I think it's worse to lie than it is to steal. And the mother says, well, why? Why do you say that? Why do you think that way? And the little girl says, well, you see, Mama, it's like this. If you steal a thing, you can always maybe give it back unless you ate it. And if you ate it, then you can pay for it. But a lie is a lie forever. A lie is a lie forever. You know, I'd say that. That's a smart little girl. Think about that, you know. How do you take back something that you've said, something you've done? Many people in our world today tell both lies and they live lies. In fact, some lies are, we're so accustomed to hearing so many lies that we hear them all the time and we don't even think about them. But when we do, we realize that it is a lie. Let me give you some pretty famous American lies. I can't say that you have the same type of lies in Korea, but you probably do. But I know the Americans, so I'm going to give you a list of them. So number one, the check is in the mail. Yeah, if you heard that lie, maybe you've used that before. I don't know. What about, I'll start my diet tomorrow. I've done that, right? What about, we service what we sell. You ever heard that, heard that lie? Your money will be cheerfully refunded. What about that one? Well, they may refund it, but I doubt it's very cheerfully. Uh, what about, this is what really gets me, one size fits all. That ain't true. I don't know how many times I've got clothes that I couldn't for. It was one size fit all, right? Uh, how about this one? This offer is limited to the first 100 people who call in. Yeah. And I like this one. Your luggage isn't lost. It's only misplaced. <laughs> or leave your resume with us and we'll get put it on file. Yeah, it'll go in the trash can, right? Uh, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Or, I just need five minutes of your time. Or, your table will be ready in a few minutes. Open wide, it won't hurt. And this is one really good. It's not the money, it's the principle. So, you've probably heard most of these lies, right? 
We hear them so much, we're so accustomed to them. But here's one that could really be the biggest lie of all. And this is it. You only go around once in life, so eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, and there's nothing after death. And there's a lot of people who believe that and live lives like that. There are many smart people in the world today, and these smart people, though, they oppose the truth of God with their lies, even though some of them don't think they're lying. You see, they don't know the truth. There are many supposedly well-educated people in our world today who don't not only acknowledge God, our Jesus Christ, but also they oppose God, they oppose the teaching of God with their lies. In our text, Paul speaks of some like that. He's back in 2 Timothy uh, 3 and 4, Paul wrote, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. Paul is saying here that some who have only a form of godliness, but deny God's power in life, are some who actually oppose God's truth. It makes sense that if a person is living a lie, probably like claiming to, be, to believe, but not really believing, then really they're probably opposing God's truth. And there's many people who say they believe in Jesus, that they believe, but yet they don't really believe enough to live for Christ. If nothing else, they oppose the truth by living a lie. So Paul here gets pretty specific about some people who oppose the truth of God. They are home invaders. Verse 6 of our text says, They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Now, what kind of deal is this? What do you think about this? Apparently, there were some false teachers or preachers uh, who would not hesitate to, as Paul says, worm their way into homes and deceive people. And, and the women are the ones who are home most of the time because the men are out working, right? So the women are at home, so they deceive them and they worm their way into the home. In Paul's time, there were pretty shady uh, type people, false teachers, who dealt in a shady manner with people. They were cheaters. They were liars. And maybe they went door to door trying to sell their goods or, or their no good goods, whichever way you want to put it. And in years past, many people from different religions also go to door to door, don't they? Trying to get converts by teaching or falsehoods or giving out written material. I remember the days. I don't know if they still do it or not. I, I don't see them. And some uh, people, maybe they're naive, but some people actually respond to this door-to-door. -door. Uh, but nowadays, I don't think it's so bad. I don't think door-to-door -door evangelism works so well. And I think I know the reason. The reason is it's because people usually don't trust people people who knock on their doors trying to sell them something. It used to be when I was little, you always had the vacuum cleaners, salesmen, and book salesmen, and all kinds of salesmen come to the door. Y'all remember that? And they were always pretty expensive, too. But I don't think people like people knocking on their doors now. I know I don't. I don't like it when someone comes to my house trying to sell me something. Do you? I don't think you do. Most of us don't uh, because I'm usually busy or I'm trying to do something. You know what? If I wanted a new vacuum cleaner, I'd go to the store and get it. I don't need somebody coming to my door trying to sell me one, right? In Paul's time, these false teachers wormed their way into homes and not to just teach their doctrines. Uh, in fact, we get the idea that they wanted to gain some control over the weak-willed women who, who had little or no faith at all. In, order, in other words, they weren't just there to teach anything, but rather to get something. Maybe they were trying to steal something or get some ideas or get the late. I don't know what it is, but what's the warning for us today? That's what we need to look at, right? Is What is the warning for us today? 
be careful about buying anything from anyone who knocks on your door, right? Yeah. But be extra careful about letting them inside your door, right? Be careful. 2 John 9.11 says, Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. So we must be very careful when someone comes to us and they're trying to teach us something, especially if it's not biblical. So what does that mean? It means we need to know our Bible. That's what we need to do is we need to know our Bible. Number two, it says they are ignorant of the truth. Verse 7 says, always learning, but never able to acknowledge the truth. Paul is actually saying that these women were always learning, but never able to know the truth, to acknowledge the truth. However, it is also true that false teachers are often always learning, but never able to acknowledge the truth of God either. This thought here is true for both the false teacher and the listener. People are always learning, but so what? If they're learning and they can't use that learning, if they have the knowledge and never use that knowledge, what good does it do them to learn? Think about that. I heard about a student, this is a true story by the way, who died in New York City. He was a student and he was 63 years old. He had been a student all his life. And the degrees that he had after his name looked like the alphabet, Ph.D., blah, 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 doctor. So he had all these degrees. He never had a job, and he never taught anyone else from all this knowledge that he had. He was a 100% student the whole time. You see, when he was a young man, a very rich relative bequeathed to him thousands of dollars a year as long as he remained in school. As long as he stayed in school, he would get lots of money. But his income would stop as soon as he left school. So the relative, really the rich guy who did this, really all he wanted to do was get get him to get a good education, right? But this person took advantage of the technicality and he just kept going to school his whole life. I look at it this way. Maybe he was always learning, which I think would be fun, actually. But he never was able to acknowledge the truth and needing to go to work or do something. So all that knowledge he had, all that education he had, was a total waste. Ecclesiastes 12.12 says, Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Don't get me wrong. Learning isn't bad depending on what you're learning in life or at school if you're able to put that knowledge into practice or into life. Education alone means very little unless it leads to good action. If you have a great education, wonderful, then use it even or teach somebody else. There is much that's being taught today in our schools and in colleges, but the truth is not being taught very much. The truth. And it leaves me a bit confused because I think many teachers uh, make things awfully complex or awful hard to understand more than it needs to be. It is the same with some preachers and some sermons and some Bible studies. They, They seem to make it more hard than it really needs to be. One thing I strive for is understanding. I don't do a good job, I know. But I I don't, you know, if I don't make it clear what I'm trying to say or what I'm preaching, then I can't do anybody any good. So I try to be as clear as I can, and it bothers me when somebody don't understand me or they haven't gotten the point, right? Right? But many listeners, though, I hate to say this, they refuse to allow the Holy Spirit 
to open our minds and our hearts to God's Word. Well, we struggle sometimes. Some people are always learning, but never able to come to the truth of God. This leaves them, you know what, wide open to false teachers who think they know something, but in reality, they know nothing. You know what? You can know absolutely nothing as long as you know God. As long as you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you don't need to know anything else. And see, many people don't really know anything because they don't know who he is. They don't know him who is the way, the truth, and the life. You have to know him. And if doesn't, anything else you know doesn't matter. Jesus, you need to know him. So what's the, what's the lesson for us here? Beware of learning anything that leads you away from Jesus and not toward him. Many things that we learn don't help us in our faith. We have to be very careful about learning things and trying to be very knowledgeable of things in God's Word, but it doesn't help us in our faith. If it helps us answer questions when non-believers ask, then that's wonderful. If it helps us in our understanding of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, then that's wonderful. But many people want to learn things that really has no effect on their faith at all. Learn first who Jesus is. The way, the truth, and the life. And so you have to be very careful. Beware of learning that leads you away, not toward him. In fact, I think you need to run away from the teachings that are teaching you something that has nothing to do with faith in Jesus Christ. Don't listen to it. Be very careful. Unless you're learning what it is that God wants you to know about him and about your relationship with him. Be very careful. Number three, they are depraved of mind. Verses 8 and 9 of our text says, Just as Janus and Jambres oppose Moses, so also these men oppose the truth. Men of depraved minds who are, as far as the faith is concerned, they are rejected, but they will not get very far because, as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. Now, there's, this is a true story. It's a true note about Dear Abby. I don't even know if they have Dear Abby anymore. When I was younger, Dear Abby, that's where everybody wrote in, asked a question. She was very smart, apparently. He asked, so this lady writes in and says, I am 44 years old, and I would like to meet a man my age with no bad habits. Dear Abby wrote back and said, Dear Rose, so would I. Well, there's, I understand that point, you know. It's probably true that most people have some bad habits. Even if it's just a matter of throwing your dirty clothes on the floor, I don't know what it might be. But that's probably the very minimal when it comes to bad habits, though. And I bet you, you all have a bad habit, at least one or two, you know. But there are far worse habits that people have than just these little bad habits that make your spouse upset. However, as bad as we are at times, hopefully we are not depraved of mind, like he, Paul puts here. When we think of depravity, we often think of murderers or bad, really bad people, uh, like Jeffrey Dahmer, who killed between 1978 and 1991, he was responsible for, they know of, 15 murders. And he was sentenced to 15 life terms consecutively. But he didn't even make it to one because he was beaten to death by a fellow inmate and he, devi he died of severe head trauma. Now most of y'all know that. Our text, however, reads this way. It says, These men oppose the truth, 
Men of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. So this sounds pretty bad to me if they're rejected because I don't want to be rejected by God or by the faith or by the church or by the faithful. Apparently here, if a person opposes the truth, meaning the truth of God in Scripture, right? Or, or if you might want to say opposing the truth, then you're opposing Jesus because he said he is the truth, right? So if you're either opposing the Word of God, which is the truth, and Jesus, which is the truth, of course they're the same. They are classified, if you reject them, you're classified as men of depraved minds and you would be rejected by God. I think this would cover an awful lot of people these days. When people don't stand for Jesus Christ, they will stand against him. And I don't know how many people I have talked to in my lifetime who tell me that they're not religious. They're not against me going to church. They're not against God. They're not against Jesus. They just don't want to believe in him. And what they're saying is, they don't oppose me, but they really do. If they're not part of us, they're against us. I got to tell you, brothers and sisters, because they're setting a bad example for others. A lot of people will stand against Jesus Christ simply by the way they live. They may never talk bad about Christians. They may never talk bad about the church. But by how they live, they stand against us. Even some churchgoers. So in conclusion, is there any hope for someone who opposes the truth? What do you think? The answer is yes, there is hope, but that hope is only in Jesus Christ. I heard the story, a true story, of a tribal chief who came to Dr. David Livingston with this request. Y'all know who he is, a missionary, right? This is the request. He says, please give me some medicine to change my heart. It's so proud, so uneasy, and oftentimes I get so angry. Give me some medicine to change my heart. Because you see, he had seen what the missionary had done for those who were sick in the body. He saw them heal people that would usually die. He saw the people, the medicine, the people who were almost dead, they would come alive because of the medicine. And he mistakenly thought, well, guess what? There's medicine. This medicine would do the same for me, for my soul. But Livingston, he tried to explain to him that the Lord Jesus alone could bring about this needed transformation of his life, that there was no medicine, that only Jesus would do it. But the man, he refused to listen. He refused to listen. He kept saying, no, no, I want medicine. Jesus alone is the great physician and the only one who can change our hearts. He's the only one that can change our sinful condition. He's the only one that can have our sins be forgiven. He's the only one that can give us a better life. No medicine, unless you want to call Jesus medicine, he's the only medicine. Only he can change our heart. The people of our world today, they want an easy cure. they just like this chief. They want it to be easy. Give me some medicine. That's what they want. But they don't want to surrender to the will and to the lordship of Jesus. That's a little bit harder to do than to swallow a pill. They don't want to do it. They want the medicine, but they don't want to obey. Jesus is the only hope for us and for anyone who opposes the truth of God. Jesus is the answer, the only answer. Let us pray.